coming from a developer background, there's so many misconceptions and myths about SEO that developers come up with or have heard or that come from the SEO world as well. Where do these come from? How do these get into the world? The myths, the legends that come through mm -hmm, about JavaScript. Yeah. Uh, I think a lot of it is people with very good intentions will try to provide the information they have available. And there's a gap in translation between uh, the SEOs and the developers and how they think and what they consider. So by going ahead and adopting acceptance criteria as mm -hmm. part of my tickets when I work with devs, that lets them know very specifically instead of being like, and I want you to make magic for me. Mm, right, and yeah. when you go from give me magic to, hey, Here's my user story. I would like to accomplish three pieces for acceptance criteria. Right. You can bridge a gap. Hello and welcome to another episode of SEO Myth Busting. With me today is Jamie Alberico. Um, Jamie, what do you do in your job? Exactly. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm a technical SEO with Aero Electronics. Um, that means that I am embedded with a number of dead teams across a number of projects. Um, we try Ooh. to execute these initiatives, get new uh, features available on the site in an effective and search-friendly way. And that means a lot of times we have to have conversations about how we're using our JavaScript. Having you here is fantastic because then we can have a conversation about pretty much everything that you want to know from the search side as well as the web developer side. So any questions that you have in mind, anything that pops into your mind? Oh, so many questions. I get oh. to poke I get to poke the black box of Google here. Mm -hmm. And I have one that's absolutely burning. Is JavaScript the devil? <laughs> oh, that's a fantastic question. Um, it might seem that way sometimes, especially when things are not going the way you want it. You see the horror stories. They're on oh, forums, yeah. they're, they're on Twitter. Everything is gone. Yeah, that, that's one thing. This, the SEO side on the developer side is also like, oh, it's a language that wasn't designed to be like super resilient. But it actually is. And then a lot of people are, oh, it's a C type, type language. And it's not really. It's a Lisp type language. So like a lot of misconceptions coming from both worlds together and clashing here. I don't think it is the devil. I think it has its benefits. I mean, it allows us to, to build really cool and, and fantastic stuff on the web and be really responsive to what the user does and wants uh, to do with our applications. And it has moved from, it has moved the web from becoming or uh, being a document platform towards an application platform. And mm -hmm. I think that's fantastic. So I think we are already pushing hard on fighting this JavaScript is the devil. And if you use JavaScript, you can't be indexed at all. So that's not true for for a long time, but I think now the documentation is catching up with like outlining the different um, bits and pieces that you should be aware of and the features that you have to deal with that are not available. One thing, for instance, is you probably have built signal page applications, right? Oh yes. Has there been problems in terms of SEO when they rolled out? I was pretty lucky. Um, I had a, a dev team who believed in SEO. That's good. That, oh, That's really fantastic. good. That was actually my the big moment of my career when I, when I got into technical SEO. Mm -hmm. And I came and I talked to one of my new developers for the first time with this very specific problem I was trying to solve. And he just paused and looked up from his keyboard and went, you're not snake oil. So I think we're making a lot of progress between yes. SEOs and devs yes. to go. That is fantastic. That's a great story. So you might hear a few people in, in the community going like, ooh, should we do a single page application? Is that risky? Um, and one of the things that uh, a bunch of developers are not aware of and some SEOs are not necessarily communicating all the time is that we are stateless. So that means with a single page application, you have a bit of an application state, right? You mm -hmm. know which page you're lo looking at and you, how you transition between these pages. Um, however, when a search user clicks on a search result, they are not having this application state. Mm -hmm. They're jumping in right to the page that we indexed. So we only index pages that can be jumped right into. So a lot of the technology, JavaScript technology, is making assumptions of how um, the user navigates to the mm -hmm. application. So like the developer, as a developer, I might test. So OK, here's my application. I click on the main navigation for this mm -hmm. particular page. And then I click on this product. And then I see that everything works. But that might not do the trick. Because but you need that unique URL. It correct. has to be something we can get correct. to. Not using a hashed URL. And also, the server needs to be able to serve that right away. Mm -hmm. if, I, if I do this journey, and then basically take this URL and 
uh, copy and paste it into an incognito browser. Mm -hmm. I want people to see the content, not the home page and not a 404 page. So that's something that we're working on um, giving more guidance for. Lazy loading, you probably have seen a bunch of communication about that one as well. Oh, yes. Like, yeah. how, do we, how do we get a rich media experience out to users, but do it in a way where if you're on your cell phone, we, we keep that very small time frame we have to get your attention. Mm -hmm, correct. And you want to make sure that if you have a long list of content, you don't bring everything into the, especially on a cell phone, right? Just mm -hmm. dealing with like 100 images. Uh, so but what that? about Ajax? What about using asynchronous JavaScript right. and XML? Right, right. That is perfect. Ooh, uh, I haven't I haven't heard Ajax being used in a while and, and spelled out in a while. Um, well, I, mean, I think a lot of everyone's using yeah. it, but no one's talking about it that much. It was just like, yeah, you just load data in as you go. Um, that's perfectly fine. Um, we are able to do that. Um, also, I often get asked about how that affects the crawl, crawl budget. budget. I knew that you would crawl would budget. Say that. Let's talk. So what worries you about that? Well, if we're using Ajax and we mm -hmm. request, say, a product detail page, mm -hmm. and we're using Ajax to supplement a lot of pieces of content to it, right. Googlebot's requested one URL, and it's gotten back nine. Yeah. Because each of those uh, Ajax calls had a unique string. Right. How do right. we handle that? And does it negatively impact mm. our crawl budget? So I wouldn't say it negatively impacts your crawl budget, because crawl budget is much more complex than you might see. It's, it's one of these things that looks like super simple, but there's more than meets the eye. We're doing a bunch of uh, caching, right? Because mm -hmm. we expect that content don't, doesn't necessarily like, update too much. So um, let's say you have this product page. You make one request to the product page, and then that makes nine more requests. Mm -hmm. we, don't make it di we don't distinct between like, loading the CSS or the JavaScript or the images or the API calls that get you the product details. So if you have nine calls from this one page load, then that's going to be 10 in the crawl budget. Mm -hmm. But because of caching, we might have some of these in the cache already. So if we have something that is already cached, that doesn't count towards your crawl budget. So if we were to version our Ajax calls, yes. those could be cached instead those of calling Those could be cached, exactly, yes. And then that's, that's one way of working around it, if you can do that, if that's mm -hmm. a possibility. Um, the other thing is you could also consider it not just a, an issue for the crawl budget, but also an issue for the user, right? Because mm -hmm. if you're on a slow network or a spotty network connection, it might flake out in the middle, and then you're you're left with broken content. That's mm -hmm. not a great user experience. You want to probably think about like pre-rendering or hybrid rendering or server-side rendering, um, anything in, in between there. And crawl budget is tricky generally because we are trying to deal with the host load situation. So what can your servers actually mm -hmm. deal with? So we are constantly adjusting that anyway. So it's like, oh, this affected our, our crawl budget negatively. Not really, because we just like had host load issues with your server, so we like adjusted it anyway. So we had um, balancing issues across your entire content. So I wouldn't say that it's that much of a deal, normally speaking. But I see that it's a very important for for people to understand that, and unfortunately, that's not that easy. Can we demystify Googlebot a little bit? Oh, yeah. Because we have this. The ominous, the great, the Googlebot, <laughs> uh, but it actually goes through a series of of. Action. So oh, we yeah. get that initial HTML parse. Yes. We find the JavaScript and CSS that we need to go ahead mm -hmm. to make our content, mm -hmm. then call those pieces. We know since Google I.O. there's actually a gap between our mm, initial parse yep. and our HTML rendering. But I want to yeah. know more because Googlebot follows HTML and HTML5 protocols. Yes. There's some nuances there I don't think I know I didn't know about. Right. Um, where say you've got uh, an iframe in your head, and you've got a closing head script right there. Ooh. That ends your head for Googlebot. Yes. And all of our lovely meta content, our href langs and canonicals below that, have a tendency to exist. <laughs> that is true. Um, there is a bunch of, of things at play. So when we say Googlebot, what we actually mean on the other side of the curtain is a lot of moving parts. So. Um, there's the crawling bit that literally takes in URLs, right, and then fetches them from the server that, so that when you are providing it, the content to us, we get like the raw HTML. Mm -hmm. That tells us about the CSS, the JavaScript, um, and the images that we, we need to get, and also the links in the initial HTML. Mm -hmm. uh, and because we have that already, we have such a, a wealth of information already, we can then start to like go off and fetch the JavaScript and everything that mm -hmm. we need to render later on. Um, but we can also already use the HTML that we've got and say, like, oh, look, there's links in here that need to be crawled. So when you have links in your initial HTML, 
we can go off and basically start the same process for these URLs as well. Mm -hmm. So a lot of things happen in parallel rather than just like one step and then the next step and then the next step. So this is definitely the start of it. And as we get the HTML in parallel to extracting the links and then crawling these, mm -hmm. we queue them for rendering. So we can't index before we have rendered it because a bunch of content needs to be, to be rendered first. Um, but in a way, that benefits us if we've got a, a single correct. page application. Yeah. We now go about how's the template, they just got to grab the content that fits within there. Correct. Yeah. So that, wouldn't that mean that Googlebot likes we These JavaScript platforms. Like that. If if the more content you get us uh, quickly in mm -hmm. the first step, in the crawling step, the better it is because we can then basically carry that information over rather than having to wait for the rendering to happen. But is pre-render always the best solution? I that's a tricky one. I think most of the time it is because it has benefits for the user on top of just the crawlers. But um, you have to very carefully measure what you're doing there. I think so. Giving more content over is always a great thing. That doesn't mean that you should always give us a page with a bazillion images right away, because that's just not going to be good for the users. Um, because they're going to have to then, if, you, if you're on a really old phone, and I have a pretty mm -hmm. old phone, and you have a page that is full of images and, and transitions and stuff, then you're like, I can't use this website. Um, so pre-rendering is not always a great idea. It should be always a mix between getting as much crucial content in as possible, but then figuring out which content you can load lazily in the end of it. So, so for SEOs, that would be, you know, we, we know that different queries are different intents, mm -hmm. informational, transactional. So elements critical to that intent should really be might, in that initial yes, parse. Yes, exactly. And you might consider if, if the intents are wildly different uh, and the content is very, very different, consider making it into multiple pages or at least multiple views if you're using a, a single page application so that you have an entry point for the crawler to specifically point at it when, when it comes to surfacing the, the search result. So treat it like a hub and let the users branch out from mm -hmm. there. Yes. So that's yes. where we'd use um, maybe our CSS toggle for visibility. That is a possibility. Um, just having different URLs is always an, mm -hmm. uh, an option. Especially with the history API, you can probably uh, in the single page application figure out which route to display and then like have the content separated between different routes or or be a little more dynamic there. We support parameters. So even if you mm -hmm. use URL parameters, basically expose the state that is relevant to the user in the URL. What other ways does that benefit our users? Because their our ultimate goal is to that's make true. them happy. Yeah. And that's our ultimate So like we are we are the same in, in terms of what our goal is. We both want to surface useful information to the user as quickly as possible. So the user's benefits are, especially if you do like hybrid rendering or server-side rendering, that they get the content really quick normally if it's done well, if it's not overloading their device. Um, and they get to jump in right where the media bits are, right? So mm -hmm. if, you, if I'm looking for some specific thing and you give me a URL that I can use to go to that specific thing, I'm right there and I'll have a great time because it's the content that I needed. So yeah, if you have performance metrics going up as well, then even if I'm on a slow phone on a really spotty network, I still get there. But I mean, our performance metrics, that's based on a lot of pieces. That we have a true. stack of technology. That is true. What should SEOs look for in our stack? Where should we try to mm -hmm. identify those areas where we could have a better experience for not just Googlebot, but our humans? Yeah, so I think a bit that is oftentimes overlooked, not by SEOs, but by businesses and developers, is the content part. So you want to make sure that the content is what the users need and want, and it's written in a way that helps them. But on the technology side, wait. So that blurb at the top, people always do, where they're like, "Here's my hero image," and then 500 words about this thing. And I'm I'm a human who wants to buy something, and there's just yeah. so much stuff in the way. Yeah. You, yeah, don't do it. Don't. <laughs> <laughs> or at least like have two pages. Have like the promotional page that you want to mm -hmm. dra direct marketing towards, and then if I specifically look for your product, just me your product. Just let me let me give you Definitely. money. So I think uh, to, talking about performance and all the different metrics is a bit of a blend of all the things. Like, look at when does my my content actually arrive? When does my page become responsive? So you look at first content full paint. Mm -hmm. You look at time to first byte as well. Less important than the first content full paint, I would say, because it's fine if it takes a little longer. If then the content is all there, mm -hmm. versus uh, so it time to first byte can take a bit of a hit. Yeah. If we deliver that faster. Yeah. First yeah, meaningful paint. Ex exactly. Because in the in the end, as a user, 
I don't care about if the first byte has arrived quicker if I'm still looking at a blank page because mm -hmm. JavaScript is executing or something is blocking a resource. Um, if, it, if it arrives a little later, but then it's right there, that's fantastic. right? And you can get there in multiple ways. I highly mm -hmm. recommend testing, 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 testing. What testing tools would you recommend? So I definitely recommend Lighthouse. Uh, mm -hmm. That's a great way. WebHint is a more, um, more broad approach as well. And uh, you could also use PageSpeed Insights or the new SEO audits mm -hmm. in uh, Lighthouse. Um, Mobile Friendly Test also gives you a bunch of information. PageSpeed how... Insights tends to look at that full page, though. Mm -hmm. And we have a bit, of a, a bit of a gap. We have almost this futurist uh, Lighthouse where we want that time to interactive, and then we have People adopt this, this methodology, and that's how we got you know so much content via Ajax because mm -hmm. full page load yeah. is fast, but all that content was still yeah. coming. So I, I would recommend Lighthouse. That gives you like the film strip view of when things are actually ready for the user to work with. So I would highly recommend looking at Lighthouse. But PageSpeed Insight gives you a good like first first view over, and it integrates with Lighthouse really nicely now. So. Wonderful. Do you think that JavaScript and SEO can be friends now, and that developers and SEOs can also work together? I do. I really think That's that uh, you know, if Google is a library and a web page is a book, using these JavaScript frameworks, let us make pop-up books and oh, rich yeah. experiences to engage with. Oh, that's a fantastic. An analogy. I love that image. That's a that's a beautiful one. Thank you so much, Jane, Thank for you being very here. Much. And I hope you enjoyed it. And see you next time. Have you ever wondered where on the map you should put UX and performance when you're talking about SEO? So have I. Let's find out in the next SEO Mythbusting episode.